Carl. I'm more convinced than when you called me that you've got a Yeti in your woods. And with the help of my young friends here, we're going to find it and photograph it and prove to the world that this fabled beast does really exist. happened yep uh i feel <laughs> mutilated <laughs> you feel mutilous <laughs> hello and welcome to hello this is the doom show i am richard folks i'm joined by the number one mutilated man jeffrey hello richard uh Please. call me sasquatch today i'll call you i'll call you hot squatch hot. i'm miss Ooh. i'm the shrieker <laughs> Call me Sassy Squatch. Okay, I won't call you Hot Squatch. <laughs> I like Hot Squatch, but it seems like it's a little bit too braggadocious. <laughs> mild. You're a mild. You're a medium Squatch. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I'm sorry. I'm losing it. We're talking about Shriek of the Mutilated from 1974, and really, who could blame me for losing my mind? Come on. <laughs> yeah, it's the 70s. Hey, hey, we are talking about a movie, uh, I already said what it was, directed <laughs> by Michael Findlay, and my eyes lit up when uh, that credit came on my screen. I was like, oh, doctor. Now, have you seen a lot of Michael Findlay films? No, I have read a lot about him and his wife, uh, Roberta Findlay, of course. Yeah, Roberta's a, a legend. Um, Quite a character. Michael's a little bit less of a legend because he died horrifically in oh, 1977. Um, yeah, playing uh, a helicopter crash. They were testing a, a 3D camera. <laughs> in france i believe and uh they they crashed it's very sad yeah um but he did have a pretty you know uh, interesting career beforehand mostly <laughs> sexploitation yeah. films um that would be outside of the purview of this show but most significantly he is the director well like kind of the director like partial director mo director of most of the <laughs> film snuff Yes, yes. The the infamous, uh, they paid people to protest so that people would get upset. <laughs> now, have you seen Snuff? Uh, no, I've I've heard about it on uh, that horrible reviews channel. Hmm. Uh, the dude I gave it a, a hilarious review, of, as I recall, but I've never watched it myself. It's great. I like it. Um, it's... It's very different from, well, it's maybe, I won't say it's very different. I'd say it's a little bit, even in the um, altered version, the snuff version, rather than the slaughter version, um, it is definitely a, a much more artistic film in some way <laughs> right? than uh, this one. Um, but there is a kinship, I think we could say, for sure. I read about uh, Roberta and Michael Findlay, the touch of her flesh curse of her flesh kiss of her flesh movies and i cannot remember for the life of me what book it was it could have been joe bob briggs's um profoundly erotic mm. the sequel to profoundly disturbing but i cannot remember if that was it i also read a book about 42nd street movies I think which I think had <laughs> a section are good guesses for where I, I just it was yet. years ago i sadly i didn't buy uh, profoundly erotic when it was out and uh you can get 
Profoundly Disturbing Now. That's a great book. But yeah, Profoundly Erotic is really hard to find now. It's mm. sad. Now, I like it. Are you a... Yeah, all those Joe Bob Briggs books are out of print, right? Mostly. Yes. Which is sad. Do, are you a Roberta Finley fan? Do you Have you seen a lot of her films? <laughs> I have seen three... Let me look. Let me look. I think I've seen um, just three. And I bet you could guess which three I've seen, knowing my tastes. Because I've seen uh, uh, Nightmare Sisters. No, not Nightmare Sisters. What is the movie that she did that was Blood a... Blood Sisters. Uh, Blood Sisters. I'm confusing yes. it with which, that other uh, movie. Which has a Joe Bob Berg's commentary. That's where, that's where I yeah. know it best, because I've watched the movie without the commentary and with the commentary. <laughs> uh-huh. But uh, no, I watched um, that and Lurkers, uh-huh. and of course I watched um, Primeval. Nice. Oh, oh shit! And the Oracle too. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I guess I've seen those. The Oracle and Blood Sisters are getting Blu-ray releases this year. Oh, I know. Wow. I'm so excited. Uh, <laughs> every once in a while, Media Blasters comes back from oblivion to say, "Hey, we still have the rights to some movies." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's like Blue Underground. Hey, 4K everything. No new titles ever again. <laughs> but at least they look good. Hey, that's fine. I, I feel like they're going to get bought out soon anyway. That's my <sighs> theory. I don't, mm. don't hold me to that. I haven't heard anything. <laughs> but uh, I mix up Roberta Finlay with uh, Doris Wishman. That's fair. In so because I've never fair. seen anything directed by Doris Wishman. Oh, boy. To my uh, knowledge. Coming soon to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I mean, I remember suggesting um, we do A Night to Dismember, and you were like, no. I mean... <laughs> We could not cover that movie. It does not. It's not even enough to like you. I know you. You love that movie. Yes. Well, it would but just you be were like. Listen, we react to things. If you are ready for about a three-hour-long podcast, <laughs> that's fine. I mean, I, I can do it. No, wait. I have seen one of her movies. Which one? Double Agent Seventy Three. Yeah. Yeah. yeah one yeah. of the 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 Boobykins. What's her name? Yeah, the Boobykins. Chesty Mort. No, 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 no. Boobykins. That's her name. <laughs> che- Chesty Morgan, aka Boobykins Morgan. <laughs> I had that T-shirt. I I bought. Um, there used to be a store down in uh of all places, uh, downtown Port St. Lucie, Florida. It was probably a front for drug buying. I didn't know this, but they just had every single something weird video and a lot of porn for rental at their little store and uh, they had t-shirts for sale and one day i bought a chesty morgan in double agent 73 t-shirt i was like well if i uh have the shirt i better watch the movie and i went oh okay (laughs) (laughs) this is the movie of my shirt everybody yeah wow wonderful very back to (laughs) mr michael finlay um I always thought that he did, oh God, what's it called? Blood Sucking Freaks, but that was not him. No, that certainly was not. No, but there is a cast connection between the two. Is there? Yeah, our our pal Karen was in uh, was in uh, that movie. Really? Jennifer yeah. Stock? Okay. Yep, she was the girl on rack. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. And she's in uh, God's Bloody Acre. Ooh, is that also Invasion of the Blood Farmers? No. Is that a totally different movie? It's not. Oh, my God. It's a totally different movie. Three mountain just... men brothers living in an uninhabited forest area love their simple lifestyle, but a construction <laughs> crew shows up. Oh, no. They're going to fight for it. I'm connecting all of these things that aren't connected. <laughs> Proud of me. Uh, let's play the trailer. I found the best trailer ever <laughs> for Shriek of the Mutilated, man. So here it is. Hope you're ready. The sight of it will live with you or die with you. But you will never forget the Shriek of the Mutilated. The Abominable Snowman, the Yeti, or is it? A scientific expedition that turns into a nightmare for all but a few with the surprise ending of the year. Sometimes it almost sounds like something human find anything out there well, dr prell thinks we might oh prell's got a thing about snowmen the trouble is that people believe that garbage of his can get themselves in trouble it's the damnedest thing ernst if it isn't a yeti i can't imagine what it could be <laughs> i could see it 
as it was chewing the flesh of Tom's leg. Ooh. Honey! Stop treating me like a child! Will you stop acting like one? Dr. Proud brought you on this mission for a reason. This is not for the weak. This is truly the shriek of the mutilated. Rated R. Folks at home, spoiler warning, because we're going to spoil whatever this was, this movie. Um, <laughs> don't watch the version on Amazon. Don't watch it any is... version that doesn't have the song Popcorn by Hot Butter in it. Well, here's the thing. This one had the popcorn, but it did not have the opening kill. <laughs> You're, okay. you're gonna love this. Okay. You're gonna love this. By okay. opening kill, do you mean <clears throat> the ten uh, seconds? Okay, ten seconds. The movie opens with someone getting decapitated, and I I found it for my purposes of grabbing audio clips from. I grabbed the movie very legally, and I saw the first few seconds. And went whoa, what the hell's going on? And then uh, Liette and I sat down to watch it on uh, Amazon Prime, and it opened without. It went right into the uh, credits. And I was like, oh, come on. So according to IMDb, uh, the VHS tape from Lightning Home Video is taken from a cut TV print that is missing much of the gore in the entire prologue sequence. The DVD from Retro Media Entertainment is uncut, but due to rights issues, the song Popcorn has been eliminated and replaced with a generic synthesizer tune. And, of course, there's the Something Weird video version, which is good. Okay, so this is all very weird to me because the version that I have opens with the shriek of of the mutilated, uh, as you would expect. But then it goes into the opening credits, which... If something was happening, like a decapitation, Can't see it. I couldn't Can't see tell it. you because it looks like a sonogram. Like, you know, you know you're having a Bigfoot, Linda. But you've seen the decapitation I'm talking about, right? No, I don't think so. Okay. we're gonna. I'm going to send you this video. This is in real time here, folks. This is important. Jeffrey needs to know how this bonkers freaking movie opens only in this one version and uh, do, 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 do. I'm calling you a dude. I've been sending lots of uh, Ronald McDonald memes. <laughs> I mean, not memes, uh, gifts everywhere because I like to torture people, apparently. <laughs> All right, it's it's in your inbox on the, the thing. So watch the first few seconds. Okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. Okay. Do you not feel cheated? I, I don't because that is not real. What is Did that? you see but do you see who's reacting? Do you see who the guy is who's going, Oh I see that person. That's that's Michael Findlay. You're kidding. And that's what I've heard in the trivia. And it's he's credited as uh decapitation onlooker. <laughs> <clears throat> what a what a character name. Man. Um, so yes, you you were cheated. A lot of people were cheated. Apparently this random version on uh YouTube just has that kill. Well, you know, I, I I'm glad I didn't see it because I wouldn't have been able to focus for the rest of the film. Um, you would have been too busy shrieking. Yeah, I would have been. Also, it is just kind of a spoiler. Not really. Doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make. It's any not even sense. the same as. Yeah. But if you go into a movie expecting a Bigfoot movie, which you would, uh, right. based on the promotion of this film, and uh, considering the first, mm, I don't know, uh, three fourths of this movie, uh, that opening would lead you in a very different direction. It didn't with me because <laughs> I was like totally fooled. I just thought this was going to be a crazy movie that had a nonsensical everything which it does eventually yeah i guess i guess you you had the right impression (laughs) but folks this is a doom show legendary title okay so jeffrey and i have been planning episodes (laughs) forever we plan things we make lists we make sub lists we make new versions of lists with things forgotten and one of us will be like well up don't leave off uh uh, delirium photos of Gioia, you know, don't leave off this, don't leave off that. You and I, according to my emails, have been talking about doing this film for <laughs> six years. <laughs> I know that the second I was done watching it, I think I emailed you like, yep. we need to do Shriek of the Mutilated. <laughs> that was 2015. <laughs> 
what the hell, dude? <laughs> it's so funny. Well, all things in time. Yes, apparently no wine before it's time. <laughs> mm. uh, so I found the infamous uh, lightning videotape here on on uh, the Googleizer. The uh, title of the, not the title, the, uh, oh my God, what's words? <laughs> I don't oh know. my God. What is it called when it has a tagline? There you go. Mm. It's coming back to me. <laughs> the tagline is, it walks, it stalks, it tears the shriek right out of your throat. That's a good one. I like it. And then on the back of the tape, it says, When the air is still and darkness silences the night, you will hear a piercing cry. And uh, here is the plot synopsis. Piercing cry, a.k.a. shriek. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Shriek of the Mutilated is a classic horror thriller that will take you to a deserted island, leave you there along with your most dreaded nightmares, all coming to life before your very eyes. Strong evidence of sightings of the abominable snowman brings Ernest Press and four of his top anthropology students to deserted Boot Island, or Food Island if you misheard them like I did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but what lo- <laughs> But what lies in store for them is a most deadly education. Terror greets the group on their arrival as one by one they are stonked, stonked, stalked by a frightening and brutal rampaging beast. It is a living hell, semicolon, hope of survival bleak. Someone must make it off this deadly island. The most earth, comma, shattering sound, dash, the desperate, comma, helpless, all caps again, Shriek of the Mutilated. Damn. Whew. Again, I feel <clears> like <throat> I've missed my calling of being a uh, 1980s uh, uh, d- d- sleeve copywriter. Well, dude, you definitely have the, the talent for log lines. We've got some great log lines from you, from your <laughs> old blog. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, boy. Uh, beautiful. Um, Food Island is exactly what I, what I called this island in my notes. <laughs> Uh, I did get it right because I wrote Boot Island or Food Island. Then I wrote, who cares? <laughs> who gives a shit? <laughs> uh, so after the decapitation scene that doesn't exist in any other copy except the one I found, we go into the credits of Darkness something. And uh, this won't be the only time where you can't see what is going on in this movie. <laughs> right now it's very dark. Soon it will be very light. Yes. <laughs> I wrote in my notes... Directed by Michael Findlay. Oh, no. (laughs) But I meant, oh, yes, obviously. Uh, We cut right to a classroom scene, much like uh, uh, when we talked about Night of the Demon last time. This is a lot of parallels to Night of the Demon. Mm -hmm. Some nice plot plot overlay between the two movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we get the child's drawings of the Yeti mythos. (laughs) Oh, my God. God. So <laughs> these so cute. these overhead slide uh, illustrations are so good. Uh for one like it's he's just cycling through a whole bunch of them. And one of them is like the yeti doing like a part of the thriller dance. Um uh, like with arms up in the air and uh fingers splayed to the side. It's very cool. Uh, my favorite is the size comparison between the Yeti and the human being. Because one, the Yeti looks gigantic. It's like double about like fifty percent more than a human being. But also for reasons I cannot comprehend, the uh, man is inexplicably wearing a, like a three-piece suit. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Oh, boy. Um, so there's a bunch of hippies or, you know, like, I, I, I feel like these. this movie was made earlier than when it was released. <laughs> but not by too much. It just these are such authentic hippie types here. Yeah, seventy four seems kind of late for that. I have to agree. Um, this one had to stew. This was this was made in the editing room. I bet you. I, I did want to note something important from that uh, lecture that Professor Ernst. Now I'm seeing on Wikipedia his name is Prell. I kept. Hearing, I hear Prell. I heard um, Pearl. Pearl. And of course, uh, press. Is all over the it's, place. So apparently it was supposed to be press, but they called him Prell? I don't know. 100% not press, um, no. which is weird. 
And well, he describes during that lecture um, something very uh, close to my heart, which is that um, Bigfoot is like a teleporting Bigfoot. Like the <laughs> second you see him, ugh, he vanishes. And it's because he's moving between dimensions or something, right? Oh, man. Well, maybe. We'll see. I we'll like see. That. Uh, one of the guys asks the professor, so uh, what's the action like on Food Island? <laughs> But, of course, it's Boot Island. <laughs> Love it. We don't have a lot of characters, which I think is a, a blessing. Holy shit. I was thinking about that. Like, th- this would be so much worse if it was like Night of the Demon with, like, you know, eight people. Instead, we've just got, like, four. Four, yeah. Got four two, plus two Professor pairs. and then one other guy. Well, oh, two other guys. One other. Oh, two boy. Other yeah. <laughs> much uh, easier. <clears throat> so their plan is to to go to this this uh, boot island and look for this yeti. Uh, the professor is uh, this is an obsession of his, as we'll find out. And uh, I I really did write in my notes. Wait, is this just Night of the Demons? <laughs> <laughs> so we we cut to a party uh, with some f- fart sounding <laughs> synths, but the version on freaking Amazon Prime, so far as I remember, because I watched it you know yesterday, uh-huh. they're playing popcorn, man. Weird. Yeah. So apparently there are some versions that have popcorn cut out. Now, if you don't know popcorn, I'm sure that Richard is going to play it right now or he's already played it because it's. I'm not going to play it because I don't want to get our episode taken down. So, folks, go to YouTube and do hot butter popcorn song or just popcorn song. And I sent you the dance. There was a a televised dance of popcorn (laughs) And the camera guys were a little zoomy with the breasts of the dancers. Like, it was so shameless and ridiculous. But the dance is just frightening. Now, do you think that Hot Butter <clears throat> is just, as a band, very litigious because they clearly only had this one song and they just milk <laughs> it for whatever it's worth that you just can't play this without getting yeah. taken down? Well, I think they've they've also monetized it. So if you go and you mm-hmm. find that popcorn song, you'll see that there's as you scroll down, there's the music credits. So they're getting their uh, their two cents worth or less. Well, in case you don't know, it's the one that goes. <laughs> there you go. While That's this it. beautiful <laughs> while this beautiful music is playing, <laughs> we're at a party. And there's a popcorn vendor giving out popcorn, and there's there's not a movie theater, and he he looks like he's either from a carnival or a movie theater. I cannot tell his his uniform is very confusing, but he's just giving out popcorn to these people. But it also doesn't look like he's there. No, it looks like two totally unrelated things cut together as a as a Michael Finlay <laughs> movie would be. This party is baffling. It's so- lit. They refer to it before they go to it. Um, they refer to it as that party. Like they don't they don't give any specifics <laughs> like, oh, it's the party at Tina's. No, it's like it's just that party. And the second we get there, we don't really have any idea. Like there are some people who are sitting on the floor. There's a little bit of limited seating. Like it mm-hmm. almost looks like it could be. If it was a very poorly run restaurant or club, but there's like cheese platters, like cheese and meat platters that are like near foot level. (laughs) There are these weird Gresham wall sculptures of heads that are all over the place. And there's this great moment where there's this couple who are caressing each other's faces while one of these sculptures is right between them and it's got a wooden pipe shoved in its mouth yes because <laughs> that's the dude that's his pipe and he shoved it in there so he, he could make out with his lady well or, or caress her face yeah mostly yeah, yeah of course <laughs> but uh yeah there's so many hippies so the, all the fashion is freaking fantastic we cut to some well in the party we're going to cut to a restaurant scene, a very important restaurant scene in a moment. But in the party, uh, the squares show up in the form of a couple of uh, this is Spencer St. Clair and his, his wife, uh, April St. Clair. And uh, Spencer, they're all like, oh, we don't want that guy here. The little backstory. It's like, yeah, he freaked out. He was like a doctoral student or a professor that freaked out. And they, they took pity on him and made him the janitor of the school. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> he's a maintenance crew. So yeah, I mean, he must be former student, even though he is clearly like 40, 48. Um, he's fairly old. I mean, non-traditional student. That's fine. Yes. Um, but yeah, seven years ago, he just went crazy for some, uh, well, to be made r- abundantly clear multiple times reason he went crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, instead of just like throwing him out to the the winds, they offered him a maintenance crew job and now he clips hedges. Um, so he and his wife come in and they're eating from a wicker basket full of Ritz crackers that's on this table in front of them. (laughs) But he clearly should not be around other people because he is just any mention of Sasquatch or Yeti. And he's just, uh, it's, uh, it's the mention of Dr. Prell and his field trips. He goes, they told me there'd be no more field trips. (laughs) And, uh, he has a monologue where he tells his story of what happened. And believe it or not, all of the people at this party are like hanging on his every word. It's actually really funny. People are taking him very seriously as we cut to scenes from White Out the movie. <laughs> Something is happening on the screen. And if you squint long enough, you realize that this is a flashback to this field trip he went on with Dr. Prell. And it's uh, his memories are very washed out, almost to the point where you can't see them. And uh, people are getting killed by this Yeti creature, and then he's attacked. My favorite part of this flashback is that it shows him crawling on the ground injured, and he waits for the director to yell, action. So he's like totally not moving, and then all of a sudden, he starts moving like a few seconds after they cut to it. It was so cute. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, we do cut to the spe- excuse me, truly exclusive specialty restaurant oh, at yeah, some fancy. point during this, um, where you know not just anybody's allowed. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we are here with Doctor or Professor. I don't know if he's a doctor. If he was ah. a doctor, he would be very mad that I didn't call him doctor. <laughs> so we'll go with Doctor. Uh, we're there with uh, Dr. Prell and Keith Henshaw. Keith is our sort of uh, main character here. He skipped out on that party in order to go with Prell to this very fancy specialty exclusive restaurant mm-hmm. uh, where we learn the specialty isn't even like advertised on like a chalkboard when you walk in. It's not on the menu. The The waiters never tell you about it. You just have to come with a weird old guy to uh, d- receive this delectable treat uh, referred to as Jin Sung. <laughs> Jin Sung. It's so funny. <laughs> I he, think uh, it means somebody, dark- somebody mispronouncing Jin Sing. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Prell, uh, he, he congratulates Keith on his uh, how great of a student he is. He says, a boy of your caliber deserves a treat like this. I don't even know. It's so <laughs> over the top amazing. A boy of your caliber deserves a treat of a combination of wild meat, which is what he calls <laughs> the food. Well, you know, they have those parties for, for hunters where they gather and they have like little raffles for guns. And you're served like frickin' uh, boar and ostrich and, and elk and all those things. I know about those parties. Sickos all. Yeah, I didn't go to it. I just know about it. Yeah, we'll come back to that restaurant a couple times. This this scene is this is very wonderfully cut together as we go back and forth. <laughs> After the party, someone's apologizing to the hostess or apologizing. And the hostess is apologizing for letting them in, letting uh, Mr. St. Clair in. And they're like, ah, whatever. It was fine. He tells a great story, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> uh, we don't really get to know our college students who we're going to follow the rest of the movie just yet. We, we get that later. But uh, we're going to go to uh, Spencer and his wife's garbage apartment first. <laughs> now, when I say garbage apartment, I mean I remember those apartments in the late 90s and 2000s because – I lived in those types of apartments. In the 70s, they were new. So they were garbagey to me because I lived in them when they were 30 years old and falling apart. Right. Very relatable. He goes under the sink and uh, he gets out the plumber's whiskey or the plumber's cleaning products in a bottle that's supposedly alcohol. He starts drinking it immediately when they get home and she slaps his face and he's it causes him to break this whiskey bottle or vodka, whatever. And then he flips out 
And you think he's going to beat her up. Nope. Goes straight for the bread knife (laughs) and slashes her throat. Serrated. Yeah. And this is where it becomes uh, quite relatable for me uh, because we then cut to him lying in the tub, (laughs) fully dressed, drinking a soup can beer and brushing (laughs) the blood off of his shirt (laughs) with like a really coarse brush. Oh, I did notice I've compared the two versions real quick. And of course... Uh, while this this throat slashing is not shown on screen in either version, uh, the one that I sent you a link to, there's a lot more blood splashes wow. on the floor, on the sink, everywhere. So I, I feel like uh, Lightning Video may have been a little heavy-handed with their cutting for uh, TV there. Uh, but the most important moment comes when uh, his wife, still alive, is uh, she's crawling along the floor and she's she's got a toaster. And my brain did not connect it. At, at all at first she's crawling she's bleeding to death uh and she's pushing this toaster and pushing this toaster and then i realize oh my god she's gonna kill him <laughs> she her, must have heard him running the bath while she was dying and decided to go grab the toaster and then in her dying moment electrocutes this guy in the bath yeah so i mean there's there's one of two possibilities here either uh, they inexplicably have the toaster with the longest possible cord or their their shithole apartment is just so small that the, <laughs> the, the distance between the kitchen and the, the bathtub, not not considerable. The answer is yes on that one. Yep. <laughs> uh, so we cut to everybody in a van, uh, Dr. Prell and the, the four college students in a van um, and a local when they're getting yeah. gas. Tr- tries to tries to warn them tries to do a uh what was his name in uh freaking friday the 13th yeah he's he's the old coot you know yeah so this is my favorite old coot in maybe any film um because i feel like what he lays down is like old warning coot poetry he has a very sort of like slurred performance uh like it's it's almost <laughs> inarticulate and i wrote down everything he said and i'm gonna do my best to uh to perform it for you now <clears throat> sonny boy i make it a practice to never interfere with someone when they're bound and determined to get someplace because no matter what i say they're bound to get there and they're bound to get what they want therefore <laughs> make not much sense to you but makes sense to me <laughs> holy shit <laughs> <laughs> oh beautiful. my god it's beautiful it's oh poetry. boy so they of course ignore whatever that was <laughs> that warning <laughs> that very vague warning <laughs> and they drive on and the scenery is so beautiful this was filmed in new york really where um, where I'm trying to see i know new york it is it is called croton on hudson new york yeah, that's not very far from me yeah wow so you're getting that you're getting that probably a little more snowy than this one yeah oh, but it's just beautiful just really i love it uh the music is fun i just really like it it looks like the girls weren't available for filming that day because they never show any shots of them looking out the window of the van or any shots from inside the van so they save themselves not only a setup, but a couple actresses' <sighs> days pay by filming that whole sequence without them. Uh, but they go to Boot Island, which is it's got a chain blocking the road, so you have to stop and unhook the uh, unlock the lock and then relock it and drive on. And they drive and drive and drive, and they get to the house. This house, I really thought they were going camping. <laughs> They're going to go to Crazy Wanda's or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but everybody jumps out of the van, and we meet our, the doc's pal, Carl. Hello, Carl. This is Dr. Carl Werner. So I love Carl. Carl is great. Um, Carl, when he lets his hair down later in the movie, uh, looks exactly like Larry Fessenden. Oh my God, but hotter. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. No one's as hot as Larry Fessenden. You know who he looks like to me? He looks like a combination of the, the, uh, the dude from Madman, the camp counselor. Who he's like the the boss of all the counselors. Brad and I literally just talked about that movie, and I cannot remember his name. But he looks like him, and if uh, freaking John Carpenter had a baby together. Okay, so uh, agreed. However, when you first said that, I thought you said Mad Men. So I was like, Are you saying he looks like John (laughs) Hamm? (laughs) I think I covered that clearly when we did our series on Mad Men. 
We did uh, episode by episode. It was that's why we're on uh, episode five hundred and seventy of Hello, this is the Dead like Show. Because we Peggy, we started this show as covering Mad Men, and then we did our whole series yeah. on uh, Breaking Bad and lots of other amazing AMC shows. <laughs> Hello, this is the AMC show. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so we meet Carl, um, and he immediately tells Dr. Prell that, oh, the Yeti is still out there waiting. Mm. So now we're going to meet our, our our lovers here. We got we got Karen and Keith. Yep. Now, Karen is Jennifer Stock, as we talked about. She's in a few things. Uh, she was in uh, freaking uh, Bloodsucking Freaks and the aforementioned uh, God's Bloody Acre, which I have totally never seen. Uh, but she and Keith have a love that is true. Uh, Keith is played by Michael Harris, who this is the only thing he ever did. And the other pair aren't a couple, but oh boy, they should be. Mm. And we got Tom, who's a total dick knuckle. Uh, Jack Newbeck. Uh, also, in, oh, oh, he was in Invasion of the Blood Farmers. This, see, this is why I'm getting mm. the mi- movies mixed up. Okay. I mean, this. That's I feel why. like this, you know, this is in the <clears throat> same cinematic universe as Invasion of the Blood Farmers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Intenuously uh, blood sucking freaks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're all <laughs> like Thanos is coming, and all of them have to join together to stop him. Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, but he will not be paired up with uh, Lynn, who's uh, played by Darcy Brown, who is my favorite character in this movie. I like the moment she's on screen. I'm like, she's so cute. She's wearing like these um, octagon, octagon eyeglasses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's intense. She's uh, got this a is Darcy. Mullet. Oh yeah, she's got a weird haircut. It's very strange. It's it's sort of a Chelsea cut, but it's just bonkers. It's mm. great. I love her freaking hair. She was in uh, this, of course, uh, <laughs> Diary of a Swinger, Bacchanal, and uh, something called Dynamite, where she played Phoebe Dinsmore. Ooh. Which uh, I don't know. I don't know what that movie is, but I'm excited about it Sounds because she's good. in it. Uh, but yeah, she has a thing for Tom, and of course, he's an unbearable dickhead, so he doesn't care. But then uh, that night, there, we see some trouble between... They show them inside the house, and uh, we see some trouble behind between Karen and Keith. They argue about how he missed the party. <laughs> and uh, he couldn't uh, go to the party because he was having the exclusive din-din. Excuse me, it wasn't just any party. It was that party. It was that party. I'm sorry. <laughs> We also see the room that uh, that Tom and Keith are sharing, uh, which has a giant wooden armadillo in it, uh, which is really good. And it seems to be like resting on a bed rather than. <laughs> uh, but it's here that we once again have reiterated to us uh, by Tom that, you know, uh, uh, Prell is just he's got a thing about snowmen. <laughs> Um, oh my god he's just real so into good. like olafs and frosties he's just like he loves them tom breaks out the most beautiful guitar i've ever seen <laughs> i think it's an old old like early epiphone hollow body the um the real slim ones oh my god i like want to jump inside the movie and rip it out of his hands <laughs> But they, they talk about the, the Yeti, and they say, uh, one of them says, I don't believe the Yeti story, but people died, so... Hmm, and he leaves it like that. <laughs> <laughs> Out in the yard, we meet a very bulky, beautiful, muscled, muscled man named Laughing Crow, and the whole movie comes to a complete stop. This is Ivan Agar mm-hmm. uh, playing a Native American. Uh, he has three credits where... <laughs> He was in a movie called Behind Locked Doors, where he played a handyman. Is that a porno? Please be porno. Please be porno. Ah, no, it's a horror movie called Behind Locked Doors. Uh, it probably ends with sex. But then he didn't work again until 2017, where he played father in La Contradicta. So I looked him up because uh, the second I took a look at him, I said, this man is not Native American. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I believe I'm correct, uh, though I've, I've got no exact confirmation of this, but his uh, his last name is Anglo-Saxon in origin, <laughs> yes. and he is, uh, according to some trivia I found, uh, he was an actor, he was a chiropractor from Brooklyn, so I'm going to say, oh yeah, not, not Native American in any... <laughs> what a beat, dude, he'd crack your neck and accidentally rip your head off, he is huge. Very barrel-chested, very hairy-chested. Maybe the actual Yeti. <laughs> he He's harmless, uh, according to uh, Dr. Prell and Carl. Uh, but he, he's got 
He's he's a harmless old buzzard. So the um, the dialogue here is actually amazing when Karen first encounters him um, because she sees him and he's chopping wood. She runs away and runs into Carl. Right. And she she exclaims a man with an axe. And he says in response, oh, my Indian. And then she responds by yelling, and Karen is mostly yelling throughout this movie. She's, oh, yes, she is. She responds to him by saying, I guess so. <laughs> That's so cute. <laughs> oh, it's adorable. <laughs> I guess so. So he is he is <sighs> mute, at least for the moment. He is mute. Um, we're we're going to get two versions of his backstory, the short version <laughs> and the long version. Yeah, um, but by mute, we mean he mostly goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's a very it's so cool bad. representation of uh, a native american character yeah well i mean it could have been worse he could have just dug himself deeper by actually having like a full speaking part and would have just said you know crypt- cryptic things it would have been even worse good point good point yeah <laughs> Oh, boy. So we cut to everyone having a party and hanging out inside (laughs) where Tom, our pal Tom, the dickhead, is sitting at the piano uh, entertaining everyone with his garbage song. He is uh, doing like a piano improv song about the Yeti as if he were um, recording a song for like How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Uh, like there's a weird line i don't i don't know if i'm just imagining this where he says like the yeti he'll make you a threesome gruesome <laughs> that's fucking nuts oh boy and this is when we are told the tale of uh laughing crow's wonderful backstory uh he he's he's traumatized and he can't speak uh not because his his vocal cords are injured he's just uh, he's just suffered so much he can no longer speak. Mm. We'll come back to that. So then Carl uh, describes the sound of a Yeti and he says it sounds like a wounded individual. <laughs> and then he tells his story of when he encountered it uh, around his property. And uh, the first thing he noticed was its sickening heartbeat. Boom, 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 boom. So we have him portraying, portraying Larry Fessenden. Yep. Running around with his gun, trying to find this this mysterious heartbeat. Our favorite actor from every movie we've covered on this show, uh, actress, excuse me, Dea Fernida. <laughs> She's a no-show. We've got the weakest, I'm, I'm kind of glad of this, the weakest freaking day for night shots ever. I've seen one film... Uh, in the, in the, I covered it in Giallo Meltdown, and I'm struggling to remember the title of it now, where... They literally forgot to add the day for night filters. <laughs> so the guy's killing someone <clears throat> in broad daylight while people are squinting at him and they can't make out what's happening, but everyone's in broad daylight. <laughs> Luckily for us, because I have a feeling the way they show the, uh, the St. Clair, his flashback and the way the credits look, I think we're lucky that they failed with the day of Fernida. This movie would have been impossible to see. uh. (laughs) I honestly didn't even recognize it was supposed to be a night scene. Yep. He talks about the moonlight and they show shots of the moon sometimes. It's great. Woof. Woof. (laughs) Um, So he breaks out the map uh, and he shows them the map of uh, Food Island, a.k.a. Boot Island. But really, it's just a potato. (laughs) It's potato shaped. The point is they're plotting their their exhibition exhibition their evacuation <laughs> what do you call it um, not ex- excavation exhibition, yeah they're all uh, they're all taking <laughs> taking their kits off what is it called when you go to something expedition <laughs> thank you okay. i couldn't close. think of the word Real expedition close. this isn't a paul nashy movie they didn't say expedition five times well in okay. a paul nashy movie it would be an ex- exhibition expedition hey <laughs> the time is propitious <laughs> Oh, I made myself laugh. So uh, that night, they're getting ready for bed. Of course, girls are in the girls' room. Boys are in the boys' room. But Keith is saying goodnight to Kelly, and he's making out with her in front of Lynn, who looks disgusted and creeped out because she should. Because for some reason, 
Keith's kissing style is when he leans in for a kiss, his neck goes like a goose's neck, and he just kind of wraps his head around <laughs> his prey. It is so gross to see him in here <clears throat> and kissing. Oh, my God. But her and Lynn are in their night dresses, and they're so adorable. I love this movie. <laughs> Well, there oh, you go. Boy. You said it. You, you revealed spoilers. You love it. Oh, don't don't worry. I, I will retract that statement later <laughs> and then say it again in a different voice so okay. you understand. Okay. <clears throat> so they go to bed and that night uh, Karen hears a sound in the middle of the night, although it just looks like the middle of the day because they forgot to put the filter on. Yep. Also, Lynn, ba- Lynn is sleeping in her glasses. <laughs> so no we don't forget who, who she is. No one who actually wears glasses <laughs> can relate to this. I... I love that you noticed that. I did not even pick up on that. I just was like, I know that character. That's Lynn because she got glasses. And like her glasses are so large. It's not like you're forgetting those are on your face. <laughs> like those are yeah. 80% of your face. Dude, they're huge. They're so great. They're awesome. Uh, but uh, so Karen hears a sound in the middle of the night and she she knocks on the wall and tries to get Keith's attention, but she can't. Uh, that scene goes what they call nowhere next day they go for a, a other hike they got a rope and they got all kinds of like gear uh tom's got a big old shotgun or, or a, a rifle and they're ready to rock and roll as they're hiking they stop to take a break and uh lynn breaks out she's very uh very cute she gets out the cups and she gets out the thermos and gets ready to to serve her her man although tom he will never be her man for many reasons but mainly he takes a sip of the coffee or hot chocolate or whatever and just goes oh this is crap and dumps it out in front of her and then he goes i'm gonna go hunt a deer so at least we have something decent to eat later Uh, uh, uh. Uh, fan of those wild meats what a prick Oh my god, I hate him. So well, luckily, he's about to die, yeah. uh, and he he does die. We get our first yeah. long-awaited Yeti attack to uh, Tom, our piano player. Here we get our first <laughs> real good shot of the Yeti. And Holy we, shit! We sort of saw him before. It, he looks a little bit like the Wampa from The Empire Strikes Back. He also yes. just looks like. A man in a costume. All right. So now, seriously, Wampa by way of like the Muppet show. Yes. And yeah, like, no, oh, it's so bad. There's this movie. um, It's called, it's from the early 90s. It's, it's, uh, it was made by like a a wildlife preserve. It's called Christy, the first female reindeer, Santa's first female reindeer. And it's a bizarre film about, you know, it's it's a Christmas film, obviously, uh, but it's about like uh, these elves and them like not wanting to make toys for Santa anymore and being depressed. And it's 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 a very strange movie. But there's this character oh. named Tanglefoot in it, and Tanglefoot is like an agent of chaos who like walks into every scene and like tries to do good things, but always just makes a mess of things. And Tanglefoot in this, in this film is wearing the out. I think it's the outfit from shriek of the mutilated. It's exactly the same. It is just shock white fur. It looks like carpet, like shag carpet. It does weird. Very shag. Like this is the most shag you could imagine. Um, And yeah, this, this is what in, in total face revealed. Right. Like the face is yep. not Simeon. It's just got like a mustache, <laughs> like a white mustache. That's it. Oh, Lieta said he looked like a giant Ewok. <laughs> uh, but if what's funny, I really like is uh, the music, the score. There, of course, there is no credited composer on this other than the popcorn song and a couple other tracks, apparently. Mm-hmm. But uh, this is all classical music, like library music. So we get some really intense uh, we're going to be hearing from a little bit of uh, the Shining music later, the classical music that was used in The Shining. Oh, yes. Dias Array. Yeah. Dude, it's pretty epic. Uh, very, I don't know what to think about library music and movies because it's it's sort of like really unpretentious and extremely pretentious at the same time. Like if the editor's like, I don't know, silence is bad, here's music. But if they're like, yeah, man. Get me Beethoven's fifth for this part, like, <laughs> or whatever this music is. Like this, this speaks to me. This is beautiful, you know. 
<laughs> I don't know. Speaks to my my frozen Yeti soul. <laughs> Tom is killed very brutally, like disgusting gore splattered everywhere. N- now, he gets some scratches on his face, and then he's dead. <laughs> Brutal, vicious attack. Uh, we cut back to the house, and Lynn is really worried about Tom, even though no one else cares. <laughs> and uh, and Larry Fessenden, Carl, is very interested in Lynn. Ooh, he, yes. he, he's like, hey, baby, take those gigantic octagon eyeglasses off your face. I know you can't see. You're telling me you can't see. I don't care. Really? Oh I just want to see your beautiful eyes. Um, it's so cute. He tells her the charming story of Laughing Crow's origins, uh, <laughs> or at least as far as we hear it here, which is clearly a lie. Uh, Laughing Crow was kidnapped by the Yeti as food and kept in a cave for a little while. Uh, but he did escape. And uh, then he went back to his tribe. And when he told them that he was kidnapped by a Yeti, they're like, you're lying. And he says, no, I wasn't. And they're like, well, we're going to cut out your tongue muscle oh and expel oh you. So that's what happened. Uh, allegedly. <sighs> I also oh want to point God. out, um, because as ever, I am watching the film as we are as <laughs> we are talking, and Carl has a wind chime in his office. <laughs> like that is not serving any function. Uh, maybe he has like really impressive burps that cause wind <laughs> or farts. I don't know. Maybe. So uh, they go off looking for frickin' Tom, and they only find his leg. And then uh, later, uh, more flirting between Carl and Lynn, he helps tie an erotic scarf on her head. Like, <laughs> I thought they were going to kiss. It was so... I didn't want to see it because <laughs> Lynn, is, Lynn is mine. But oh my God. So she goes outside. Uh, she's like weirdly sweeping the grass with the broom. Oh so she God. finds... Uh, I guess it's L- Laughing Crow's broom and just starts sweeping the grass. And then she finds something, we don't see what, in the old greenhouse see, while I the others like, are away. I feel like that's a moment we need to dwell on for just a second. Because sure, let's do it. The, the sweeping of the grass is insane. Why does this happen? We're 45 minutes into the movie. Uh, <laughs> Lynn is, I mean, they just found a leg. Yep. And she just walks across the st- well, walking is generous. It's like stumbling across the grass, picks up a broom and just sweeps the grass for about like not even not even like with any sort of effort. It's three seconds of sweeping the grass and then just dropping the broom and running into that. It's very house. wistful. Very wonderful. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, so after she sees something in the greenhouse, she's running away screaming from the house and everyone's trying to get back in time to find her. Uh, but as she's running, she loses her glasses and then she gets her foot stuck in a rock <laughs> or up between a couple of rocks, which Been is there. very funny. Yeah. And all she has to do is, you know, back up, stop trying to run. But, you know, hey, the Yeti is after her. The, the heartbeat's pound and it's coming for her. So she's <laughs> lost it. And the best part is that her foot is clearly not stuck in the rocks and she's just acting so hard that it is. Yep. Um, it's 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 a uh, virtuoso. Very much so. Uh, the Yeti gets her and the Yeti uh, does some scratches on her face and she's dead. <laughs> and then uh, when they find her, they find her body. Karen proceeds to belt out her secret weapon. This actress has a though she's the real shriek of the mutilated this woman jennifer stock can scream <laughs> it is so horrifically annoying i would never mess with this person if she <laughs> screamed in my face it is i kept turning my tv down farther and farther until she got over it oh my god it was so funny i oh. guess so i guess so uh, they go back to the house and they've got a uh, <laughs> freaking uh, Tom's leg uh, on the table or just a boot with a towel over it. <laughs> and they want to use this, his uh, leg as bait. 
to uh, to attract the Yeti. And now Keith, his you know his best buddy, he's very upset about this for exactly three seconds, and then he uh, like really realizes that this is the only way to catch the Yeti, and so he has to convince Karen, who thinks what they're doing is barbaric. Um, and honestly, this whole exchange uh, with her trying to convince them what they're going to do, or what the, what they're doing is wrong. I am putting this as the intro to the show. Mm-hmm. I love this exchange. It's just so fun. <laughs> uh, my um, favorite moment in this is when um, <clears throat> they're trying to calm Karen down and uh, Dr. Prell just says to her, you know, eh, yeah, okay, a Yeti killed your potential boy. Uh, well, no, that wouldn't be her boyfriend, but uh, the Yeti killed uh, everybody. It's just a simple oddity of nature. <laughs> Yes, it is. It's very odd. It's extremely simple as well. <laughs> extremely simple. Slightly odd. Oh, boy. Uh, that night, uh, very jarringly, all of a sudden, Dr. Prell bursts in. He's been gone. He's been out by himself looking for the Yeti. <laughs> and uh, he bursts in and like he's all tore up. And they're now discussing, oh, my God, I wrote in my notes... You can clarify what I'm talking about here, Jeffrey. I know you can see inside my mind at this point. No doubt. I I wrote that they're discussing the Yeti's lovemaking technique. And then I wrote in my notes, then I wrote in my notes, this Yeti, he's the real heartbeat of America. Listen to the heartbeat of America. Listen to the heartbeat of America Well, uh, we are told that the Yeti's heartbeat pounds like an air hammer, which is highly erotic. So I understand. <laughs> must, I don't know what I was talking about. <laughs> uh, um, he, um, no, he's, yeah. So uh, Prell says he encountered him. He's all messed up, must up because of it. He gives us lots of great details. Like there's a real fetid aroma that the, uh, the Yeti has a subhuman face and then it's a very rare specimen, you know, like a rare, shiny, holographic Bigfoot. Like the one you really want in your pack of cards. It's going to perform next to uh, Biggie Smalls and his, his comeback <laughs> oh, that tour. Co- that's hologramic. Oh, you said holographic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I just, I'm still wondering <laughs> about his lovemaking technique. Well, I'm imagining, I'm imagining like a hologram, like right next to the Tupac hologram, you've yeah. got the Yeti hologram <laughs> doing good. the thriller dance, oh as I mentioned God. before. Beautiful. And, and Kurt Cobain's there too. That's great. <laughs> now the plan is to use Lynn's body as bait and Karen's not into this at all. But uh, this part of, of the movie just blew my mind. So the freaking professor... Our Dr. Prelliness, he says, I have a foolproof plan. Let me draw it up. And then he proceeds to start drawing up his plan in real time in the movie. (laughs) I was so mad. I was like, why? Why is this happening to me? We're like not even an hour in. We've got time to spare. So it's fine. Apparently. (laughs) Uh, So uh, Karen finds Tom's body in the greenhouse. And but then it it was it turns out to be quote unquote all a dream that she didn't really see that because mm. everyone's telling her that didn't happen uh, and her, she's screeching and screeching and screeching again. Oh, not shrieking God. yet though. We're not in shrieking oh, mode quite God. yet. Close. Uh, so she wakes up to laughing crow trying to smother her with a blanket. <laughs> And I just, I wrote in my notes, laughing crow with those faces he makes. This movie is a goddamn train wreck. Sweet mercy. That's my exact notes I wrote. (laughs) So now they're setting another trap for the Yeti. um, And they're going to use Lynn, Lynn's body for the meat. And this is when uh, Karen has insisted that she's coming along to take pictures. Mm Mm-hmm. She's like, I don't agree with what you guys are doing, but I might as well be a part of it. It's like, what? <laughs> Why do you need to be a part of it? Yeah, if you if you don't see it, it didn't happen. So here's the fun thing about this movie. They set up lights, like actual lights to catch this Yeti. They've had no lights 
at all in this movie. So they've had to film all the nighttime scenes during the day. And this is obviously like where they are just right outside the house where they're filming. So they're using like the floodlight from the house on this sequence. Oh, it's so good. (laughs) Everyone's ready to rock and roll. Poor Lynn's corpse is tied to a tree. We got a big scare. We're like, I hear it. I hear the heartbeat. What's what's happening? And then they turn the the lights, and there's the Yeti just a few feet away from freaking Karen, and she starts s- shrieking. I almost said screeching. She starts shrieking. Hey, you've got this like uh, you know man sized bunny rabbit tumbling down the hill towards her. <laughs> and scary. It is fr- yeah, I'm shocked. So we're hearing the heartbeat, and we're hearing the heartbeat, and we're hearing the heartbeat, and then all of a sudden we see Laughing Crow in the house. He makes a little boo boo. Laughing, laughing crow has, is playing a tape <laughs> with an old, one of those old beautiful reel to reel tape players. You bet. And it's it's the sound of the heartbeat. But then he touches it, and all of a sudden it starts playing <laughs> circus music. <laughs> because you know you put your uh, oh. your 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 yeti uh, sound effects on the same <laughs> exact reel yes. as the circus music. Here we go, folks. This is when we find out, this is the first ending of the movie, of the next three or four endings of this movie, where we find out that because of this boo-boo, uh, Carl and the and the doc have to kind of retreat, and they're discussing how they are freaking cultists. So Keith's been knocked out, presumably by the Yeti. We don't see what happens to him. We just know he gets knocked out. And then uh, freaking Carl and Doc are just patting themselves in the back, on the back, and they're so happy that Karen is in shock. And that she has no bruises because their sacrifice can have no marks upon it. Uh, Yes. So we learn that Carl will want his dinner. So we need to then see the preparations of uh, Laughing Crow as he makes dinner. Mm -hmm. Um, This is all cut extremely confusingly. Oh, boy. We have like this extreme close up of a covered face and an exposed neck. Um, and you know, we're, we're going to have the, the head presumably chopped off. Uh, and it is, it's, uh, Tom's neck, uh, yep. and Tom's head. And it's going to end up in a, in a, in a simmer pot pretty soon, uh, alongside like two carrots and some like green onions that, uh, laughing crow has chopped up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Do they and, even show the head in the, in the, in the water? Do they show mm-hmm. the head at all? Well, at a distance. <laughs> okay, because I don't remember seeing the head, period. It, so. Yeah, because they don't want you to see it too close because okay. it is it is poor. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, we start hearing some, you know, they, they start talking about this order that they belong to. Right. I never really get the actual name of it. Like they say here, like, the code of the votary demands no body bruises. I. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, Keith Keith comes to and Keith comes a running and he uh, he he gets the drop on these guys. He's got the rifle and he bursts in. He's like, I heard everything. Ha ha! And he's got the gun on them and they're like, you're you're useless. That gun is useless. So he shoots the professor, but nothing happens. And Carl very confidently says, Now try it on me. <laughs> and he pulls the trigger and sure nothing happens. All uh, blanks. And that's when uh, Laughing Crow sneaks up behind him with a big boner. A big oh, sorry. bone. A big bone. And uh, knocks him unconscious for approximately 20 seconds of the movie. Yeah. Uh, they, don't, I- they don't kill Keith. They actually knock him unconscious again. He immediately wakes up again while they're distracted and runs away. <laughs> Steals the van and runs for his life. And Lietta was like, what an asshole. I'm like, uh, I think he's going to get help, maybe? <laughs> and mean, yes, he's going to get help. He is. He definitely has a concussion, too, so we can't judge him too harshly. No, he's this acting very strange. Bone-brained. This is so good. This is so good. So he's driving down the road, and he knows there's other cultists coming because we hear the shining music. Yes. And there's all these like, fancy like Lincoln town cars and fucking Cadillacs coming <laughs> up the bridge. Here's Keith's big plan. He parks the van, gets out, runs across the road, and then hides under the bridge. Yeah. And then, after these cars have passed, he gets up and runs back to the van, which is now stuck in a freaking uh, 
like a, a rut in the side of the road and has to abandon said van and then run to town. <laughs> This well, is so stupid. My favorite I love part. It. My favorite part is that um that Carl actually phoned all of these uh, people in the Cadillacs driving up um to come. You know, there's yeah. guests for a uh, ceremony dinner that's about to, or excuse yeah. me, ceremony breakfast that's about to occur. Um, but he calls them <laughs> as they're staying at the quote cozy rest motel. So, Oh, I just love oh the idea God. of like all of these like uh, exotic uh, like kings and uh, countesses staying at this place called the Cozy <laughs> Rest Motel. It's like, uh, you know, just right off the highway, the Cozy oh, Rest I, Motel. I can't wait till we get to these people. Uh, so then we have Karen uh, waking up and just, you know, totally not knowing what has happened to her. And that's when the Yeti bursts in to her bedroom. And she manages to shut the door and run and hide in the bathroom. And then she's so she's trapped in the bathroom with the Yeti banging away on the door and screeching. And she's screaming and shrieking. And we're going completely batshit crazy here. This sequence is great. Mm -hmm. But then the shower is running and she opens it and there's nothing there. But then in the little closet there where they keep all the toilet paper, presumably they hoarded it during the pandemic. <laughs> yep. She... the Inside is a dead, quote unquote, corpse of a uh, laughing crow with a big knife. <laughs> He's looking like a ghost that Haley Joel might see in um, uh, uh, The Sixth Sense. Like they've painted him all white and he comes out of a, like a crawl space. Oh my God. But this actually scares her to death. So we have two Yeti movies with people getting scared to death and <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> help. Oh my god, that's when we discover cuz uh you know Laughing Crow carries her body. No, wait. The 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 Yeti. The Yeti carries her body down to the freaking what do you call it? To the couch. And then he takes off his mask and he's like, "Ha ha, I am Carl. I'm not really a Yeti." <laughs> and for some reason all I could think of was the big the first murder sequence in Freaky Farley. <laughs> I don't know why the ha ha. I can all I could think of is Matt Farley jumping up and down stabbing. That was great. My favorite part of this is that uh, after, you know, they come down a little bit from the high of uh, scaring her to death with no bruises, uh, they uh, both Carl and um, Dr. Prell have a, a really charming discussion about who which one of them it was that really frightened her. To oh, death. they're so pleased with themselves. <laughs> it's so cute. Yeah. Oh, love it. And so then we have all of their guests arrive. <laughs> And I wrote in my notes, oh, no, there's an African king among these cultists. <laughs> this is a real <sighs> death wish club, if I've ever seen one. <laughs> it is so terrible. We're he's <laughs> he's done up like a traditional, like, stereotype of a medicine man. It's so wrong. I miss his name. I don't think he has a bone through his nose. Thank God. No, he's got a big Okay, like, folks. Dress. Here's the thing about this movie, folks. Now- I, at this stage, this third ending of the movie here, I was so sick of this movie. I hated this movie. And then I remembered why. Because I have podcaster syndrome. <laughs> I had to remember that taking notes on some bullshit like this is literally painful. <laughs> I hate note-taking movies like this so much that I forget how much I'm enjoying the movie. I really did love this, this whole <laughs> reveal. And not only are they doing all this crazy shit, they are introducing nearly everyone at this banquet. You bet. Lord like Belbereth, yeah. Countess Winchester. <laughs> it's the whole crew. Oh no. It is. And then they start telling stories about how they've been successful at different events. <laughs> Uh, Countess Winchester oh burps god. and everybody laughs. It's great. Oh my god! Then they then Keith finally gets the cops. He shows up in the cop car with the fuzz, and of course, shock of all shocks, when they burst in, he asks the deputy guy to arrest them, and of course, he's in on it. He's one of the cultists. Mm, no. Dun dun dun. And he's like, Keith's like, so you're some sort of devil cult, and they're like, 
Well, like, you know, you go a couple <clears throat> generations back. Yeah, I guess so. But uh, they you take know. the time. They take the time in this movie in the last act to explain how they used to be Satanists, <laughs> but they and they took certain elements from yeah. said belief system, but not all of them. They just needed a few little things. And I am like, what the actual fuck is going on? Like, it is crazy. Then while they've got Keith, you know, held hostage here. He's screaming, where's Karen? Where's Karen? We'll get to that in a second. And <sighs> well, they also explain like what they're what they've been doing, right. which is right. that they they, um, <laughs> they they draw off suspicion from their, you know, devil twice removed cult uh, with a little bit of theatrical Bigfoot shenanigans. <sighs> um, which, we, <laughs> they don't have to explain that. Why are they explaining? We get that. Why not, though? Just for well, the, I mean, I know, I know why not for for but, the but for, for the my Karens purposes, and Lens in the audience for my three pages of solid notes. I want to know why are they explaining what we know the moment we saw <laughs> fucking Carl take off the costume? Oh my god, such a Scooby Doo ending, dude! But like, yes, if if the Scooby Doo show was an hour and a half every freaking episode. Well, that is how they make them now, because they're feature-length films, ah, and, true. Uh, and I love them all. Um, oh, so, boy. so Keith is apparently the one who's been selected to carry the Yeti legend back to the people, just like uh, uh, Saint Clair, just like Saint Clair, which that clearly worked wonderful. Gangbusters nailed it. Nailed it. Uh, but it's also a little confusing because they're clearly like trying to bring him into their cult a little bit. I mean, that's why right. Prell brought him to the uh, the exotic specialty restaurant earlier and uh, it's implied what's happening here at the end as well um so it's a little vague it's um, revealed it's revealed to keith that he's been eating people this whole time so that specialty dish was people and all of the <laughs> meals they've had at the cabin at the house have been freaking people and he's very shocked about this but then the professor calls one of their uh distant uh, factions or distant members <laughs> of this cult and they have a whole radio conversation where a guy who yes. looks vaguely like a nazi like a yeah. photograph on the table talks to the this people these people and congratulations congratulates them on their success mm -hmm. and it's i am lost at this point and not because i don't know what's going on i'm lost because i've i'm being explained in very like multitudinous details I don't know, multitudinous. I just wanted to use that word. And we find out that it's Saturnalia, mm -hmm. which is a detail that uh, very much confused Lieta and I. Like, what? <laughs> so apparently they do this on Saturnalia. So they're trying to tie it in with a, a, a pagan thing, too. Yeah. I guess. Sure. And then we see poor Karen. They they wheel Karen out on the sacrificial table. Oh, they don't wheel her because it doesn't have wheels. They have to pick up this gurney looking table and carry her in. And when Keith tries to grab her body to maybe revive her, maybe he doesn't really believe she's dead, that's when the cultists pick up their knives and chase him into the other room and start stabbing the shit out of him, which is the fourth ending of this movie. Which is also very weird because he is not dead. No. He is instead just sort of fake stabbed like into injury. Like he's unconsciousness. Little, he has little uh, poke holes and little tiny blood dots on his white sweater he's wearing. He does. I don't really see the holes, though. I just see like little ketchup stains. It's um, bad. Oh, it's so bad. Yeah. So I guess oh. like they just like, you know, it's like acupuncture. They just prick him a little bit. <laughs> um, and he, and somehow that makes him in order. lose consciousness. <laughs> so then he wakes up. And they are strongly encouraging him to join this cult by uh, partaking of uh, good old <clears throat> Karen's body. And then we get our, our freaking amazing last moment of the movie, which is uh, Laughing Crow holding up the electric carver and finally saying his first words, which I believe are, Dr. Prell, do you want white meat or dark meat? And then we have keith drooling and madness as he's gone completely insane and the end well see it's actually slightly better than that because he says mr henshaw which oh. is keith okay so sorry they're gonna feed him the meat too oh, the karen okay. meat and they're asking him if he wants white or dark which i think is very um you know considerate hey I'll take dark, honestly. I, I don't know if I've mentioned this on the show before, but uh, of all of the graphic horrors 
that I've witnessed in all these horror movies for the last lifetime. Uh, cannibalism yet to gross me out. So like, <laughs> like someone eating a rotting corpse is obviously disgusting. A rotten meat would be gross, but I've never really been like grossed out by people eating people. Cause like, I just, I really love pork tacos and I'm assuming that once in a while kitchen mishaps, I've probably eaten a few people over the course of my life. So it's fine. You're like, I need a Karen. No problem. <laughs> I would eat a Lynn first. Hey. <gasps> so I have no trivia on this movie. Yeah. Other than the weird, the confusing, uh, I mean, there's a whole list of goofs, which are, I don't think are fair to really <laughs> go through. <laughs> like, okay. No, um, no. Yeah. It's just weird that there's not much information on this film. Well, I guess that's what happens when your, uh, your director gets like cut up by, uh, <laughs> by a propeller. I don't know. <laughs> no no chance to interview him. cover anything on, uh, the Findlay's? That's a good question. I feel like he must have. I feel bad. I didn't, I didn't even think to look this up in the, uh, I mean, I figure if he'd written something, somebody would have like shared a bunch of it on the freaking uh, IMDB page. Uh, why don't you tell me, uh, Jeffrey, how do you like this movie you waited six years to talk to me about? I mean, clearly I love it. I must. Um, uh, no, I, I adore this movie. It's great. Um, you know, I think it's uh, it's not every movie that I, I watch immediately and then uh, proclaim to you that we simply must do it at some point in the next <laughs> decade, because uh, this is a movie that is firing on all of my cylinders. Um, it's it's again kind of got that Z grade um, slash TV movie vibe. Um, where, uh, for much of the runtime, not, not much is, is really happening. And when it does happen, it's, it's largely unexciting. Um, I love, <laughs> I love the, uh, the return of the King type, you know, four endings, um, especially because each ending is better than the last. I feel like it just keeps ramping up. Uh, the character, the cast is, is fairly small and the characters are, um, adorable on the whole, even those who, uh, who depart too, too, too soon. This is just has one of those wonderful vibes that uh, we so often talk about on this show. Um, in this case, I guess it's the Croton on Hudson vibe. Um, oh, I love that, how it was filmed near you. That's so great. I know. Fairly near. Yeah. I mean, Hudson River, baby. Uh, yeah. Uh, great. Uh, nothing. Nothing bad here. Hour 24. <clears throat> nice clip. Perfect. Perfect film right here. How do you feel, Richard? <laughs> Um, well, like I said, I, I started off loving this and, uh, uh, within seconds of its beginning, Lietta immediately asked me if this was a Jeffrey movie. <laughs> and, uh, I, like I was saying right near the, uh, the hour and 10 mark hour and 15, I was so angry. So I'm just <laughs> filling up pages of notes. My hand is tired. I am really tired from writing. I'm just like, this is so awful. And uh, but yeah, overall, I love this movie. Um, I'll need a while before I watch it again, but I really want to spring this on somebody. My pal Jason, uh, who I've been showing movies to, not so much during the pandemic, but uh, we have been enjoying lots of uh, crazy movies. The funniest thing that happened was when I showed him uh, uh, Nightmare City, mm. my good old Umberto Lenzi, and he got really mad about that twist ending. He <laughs> flipped out like, what? I hate this movie. And he always mentions that as being the movie he hates the most of all the things <laughs> I've showed him. But I really want to drop this on uh, Jason completely unexpectedly and just act like nothing's wrong. Uh, <laughs> um, I like the different versions. I love how I found this magical intro that isn't anywhere else that gives you a clue as to what's actually going on, though doesn't because it's just yeah, baffling. Not really. Because the, it's not a Yeti chopping the guy's head off. It looks more like um it looks a like witch. a person dressed in a Yeti costume. It looks like a, like a, it's supposed to be like a witch doctor with like a right. weird headdress or something. Yeah, it's yeah, very, yeah. very stupid. Weird. Um, <laughs> I like the wintry vibe and the clothes. Love Lynn. Lynn is like, I'm the, I'm, I'm the shriek of the linenated. I love mm. her so much. It's a, it's a clunky disaster. Uh, very clunky, very, very like ramshackle, but it's very lovable. And it has got some freaking uh, chutzpah to it, man. It It is proud mm -hmm. of its 
total insanity. Absolutely. So, yeah. Bold. Thank you. Thank you for picking it. And um, I'm sorry it took us six years to get to it. <laughs> Maybe it was the right amount of time we had to wait. I'm really curious. I got to look at that uh, that first email where we started making our the Jeffrey tapes, which were based on the disc tapes from. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I forgot that's where it came from. <laughs> what was that movie? The 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 Kindred. kindred. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Kindred. <laughs> the Kindred, uh, which oh, I believe man. when we recorded that I was like any day now that'll be on Blu-ray. <laughs> <laughs> Synapse. Just waiting that was, and waiting and waiting. That seriously, folks, we're on episode two hundred and seventeen, two hundred eighteen. I believe the Kindred was like episode forty something. Because yeah. I remember the first episode was with uh, House of the Laughing Windows, which is so funny. That is like one we would never cover now. Like, that's not weird enough for us. <laughs> uh, I think you go back to that one. It's no, I love that movie. Weird. I, I love it, but compared to everything else you and I have done over the last few years, it is so normal. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> oh boy, but yeah, the kindred kind of kicked things off. That's great. <laughs> it was that was the real first episode with you because that's when the disc tape started. I, I we we pre-recorded the entire show separately on uh, cassette tapes and just mailed them to each other. You bet. It's the only <laughs> way to do it. <laughs> Well, folks, thank you for listening, and Jeffrey, thank you for joining me. Thank you for shrieking in only the softest manner. Uh, really helped me get through all this. I, I said, Jeffrey, do you want me to put on my baby blue nightgown? And you said, not yeti. Well, yeah, because I said, uh, I have to put on my octagonal glasses first. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I'm going to bed. Let me put my glasses on. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine trying to sleep with your freaking glasses on? That'd be so <laughs> <laughs> i mean you'd need a new pair next to the bed because you would destroy them <laughs> you sure would <laughs> oh i'll tell a fun story from my childhood to get us out of here please uh my sister cindy uh she was my eldest sister and uh, she was not happy that she had to wear glasses she hated her glasses hated 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 them so um she cleverly gave them to me to play with and of course i broke them immediately and then she went mom mom look ricky broke my glasses and my mom said what did he do climb up your face and take them off your head you gave him your glasses you're gonna have to pay for those and my sister got in big trouble <laughs> so that happened last year that was the last yes. time we were the whole family was together no i was like two Back, well, back when I was prone to climbing up people, stealing their glasses. Weirdly, I have a a, a story uh, too that's it's kind of like that about <clears throat> glasses. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I had a uh, I wasn't uh, diagnosed with needing glasses until about the uh, the fourth grade, and when I was, I was so mad about it that I started a devil cult that was a yeti cult, and then we <laughs> ate some people, but they didn't have any bruises on them, which made them taste a lot better. Better. And there was this guy named Keith, too. Uh, we stabbed him. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then I'm here today and I've accepted that I need glasses. It's just took a while. <laughs> and now I'm a successful businessman. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know the end of your story. I don't know you. <laughs> uh, bye, folks. <laughs>